Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, off you go. Welcome, everybody. It's episode 19 of the Telemedia News in 10. Yep, we've been going for 38 weeks. Uh, it's me, Jarvis Todd, with the Dennis Rodman of all things Telemedia, Mr. <laughs> Geldon. Hey. <laughs> Do you, like the, do you like the reference? Now, we are celebrating Telemedia 8.1's six-month anniversary, and we've got a special uh, session with uh, our third special guest. Um, he is certainly a contender for Telemedia Man of the Year. Uh, he's our friend. He's the colourful Mr. James McFarland, CEO of PM Connect, who have hit the news big time uh, last week. So, hi, James. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you. And I'll tell you what. So we're really excited that, that about the news with the NBA. I'll tell you who's not excited about it, uh, my fiance, because I wear this outfit everywhere. <laughs> now, <laughs> okay, sure. now, now we're gonna we're gonna talk about the outfit a little bit later on. I, I, I don't know if Paul's got uh, any props. I went out into the garden to find a basketball, but it was all kind of pink and it lost its colour and it looked. I like did the, the I did the same. Yes, yeah. I've had a deflated. <laughs> <laughs> terrible looking basketball in the undergrowth but yes so, so listen everyone we're live this is also part of a demo that we're now going to be using the 8.1 live studio for uh these uh these sessions we're also going to be offering that out to the industry to run live webinars and we're also going to be running a series of round tables so um it is live if anyone's out there wants to drop some questions into us they can do I'm just going to tell you what we're going to be covering. Most of the session is going to be talking about James uh, and the big news from last week about the deal that they did with the NBA. Great news for DCB, great news for the industry. And I think such a big win worthy of a highlight. Uh, we're also going to touch on a couple of other stories. Live game streaming continues to surge in 2021. And we're also going to be going back to our friends at Appani who have put some data out regarding brands and embracing in-app gamification. I've also done some research on that session and uh, I, I have to say it is mind blowing what's going on on some of those platforms. So um, I always say this without further ado, every time I watch it back, I say I won't say that, but I've done it. So here we go. Right. Um, the big story of last week and uh, one of the probably the biggest stories of the previous 12 months was NBA to reach new fans in Europe and Africa with landmark international DCB payment partnership. 22nd of April, the National Basketball Association has partnered with mobile payments and marketing specialists, PM Connect. That is why we've got James here. Uh, it's an international deal uh, for its premium live game subscription service, NBA League Pass. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of that, and I think we, we, we really want James to sort of get, uh, put some meat on the bones of that story. Um, I just want to give you a bit of background or ask James a little bit about his background uh, with how he got started with PM Connect because uh, I noticed he came straight out of the University of Leicester with a first class honours degree. Congratulations, James. Very good. Thank you. Puts us all to shame. Uh, <laughs> and he came straight out of the university and founded PM Connect in 20, uh, 2010, which means he's done absolutely nothing else apart from work uh, on this particular business and made it a success story that it is today. Um, I'm going to pass over to James after I've read a fantastic quote from him from LinkedIn, uh, which goes along the lines of, I, I hope you didn't write this at three o'clock in the morning, uh, having had a few lagers, <laughs> James, but here we go. <laughs> I would have never believed 10 years ago when I was sitting in my pants running a small business from my bedroom that I would be signing a multi-million, multi-year deal with a billion dollar business. It's humbling to look back at it all. I just thought that was really touching. So my first question, James, is how did you get from your pants in the bedroom to wearing the pants in the boardroom? Of well, a you know, you know what's, what's quite funny is, um, I kind of said this the other day, it's kind of come full circle. So with COVID, I started off in my pants and then I've been running the business in my pants since, <laughs> since we've gone into lockdown. Um, but yeah, um, it's it's been crazy. You're right. I came out of university. I started business straight out um I won't give you the nitty-gritty but I, I was hustling through university you know I used to s sell student phone deals I used to sell um iPod skins iPad skins I used to import them from China when I was 16 so I always had that entrepreneurial flair um 
What you might not know about me is, is, is so PM Connect has always been PM Connect, but my first venture with PM Connect, we actually used to run the UK's largest mothering network. Mother. Um, yeah, so we, we ran babies.co.uk, pregnancy.co.uk, babynames.co.uk. Um, I even published a, a book, the best-selling baby names book in, in the UK uh, with, with Ebury. Um, I think Ebury, oh no, Random House Penguin, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so we, we, we tried a few different things um, when we started out because what our business model was, look, we want to make a difference on the internet. And that's, that's as, as much as the business model was. Um, and so we, 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 we uh, ran the baby uh, website. So we come from a content background. Um, I actually run a mobile insurance website, which was alongside Protect Your Bubble that you know now. And I think they now own that website. Okay. Um, and, and then... Um, we, 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 we started to see the potential in mobile and my chief researcher of that is my mum. She's so slow at, at, at basically adopting technology that I knew when she got herself a smartphone, I was onto something because everyone was probably getting it that year, you know? Oh, right. Um, and, and we, we started to go, all, all the rest of the business ideas we had was that we're, were lifestyle businesses. And we said, how do we do something that we can change um, something globally? Um, and mobile was a really hype phrase, right? Um, and I think back then, I was in perfect time, perfect place. So I don't know if I always thought when I was an entrepreneur, I was like, I wish I was around at the beginning of the internet, right? Because I could have made so much money, or I could have done this, or I could have done that. Um, and I was around at the start of when smartphones, I remember when the, the you know, the, the iPhone, uh, the iPhone one like launch, I remember how excited I was. So I was in perfect place, perfect time. Um, we started to mess about with basically phone, phone paid services um, uh, and saw little success. You know, it was me learning. I, I didn't know this industry at all. I wasn't surrounded with people, but we kind of did different things. We ran like a, a joke line. We did some directory um, services. We ran some competitions and we kind of did all of those. And we, we thought, this doesn't feel right. You know, this doesn't feel like the business we want to build. Um, and we kind of thought, well, what happens if we take this fantastic um, payment method um, and actually put some really, really nice content behind it? You know, like it, it, it seemed it seemed like a crazy idea for the industry at the time, but it was like made so much sense. Um, and so we did that because I came from a content curation background. You know, I put together a whole mothering network, not knowing, not having any children or knowing anything about mothering. Um, and so we kind of did that and we, we pitched it um, with the payment provider to EE. And, and they loved it. And, 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 you know, I put in that post, E really gave us our first step up. Um, right. They believed in us, they worked with us. We were a young, naive um, and hungry business. We made some mistakes along the way, um, but we always had the support of the carry partners we were working with. And to be honest, after we started working with EE, when you partner yourself with such a forward thinking large carrier, your business, from running a mothering network to partnering one of the largest businesses in like in the on the planet your business goes to this next level so we kind of focused on that all the content was owned and operated by us um, and we started to scale it out globally to different carriers um, with mixed success there's a very common misconception that business in the uk um is done is exactly like business in south africa <laughs> but it's not, yeah. you know, and I learned that through, we, we didn't know. Um, so we just started to scale globally. We then looked at how do we increase um, uh, the quality of our product? Well, we partner with billion dollar brands instead of us putting it together, you know, we'll do the technical payment and marketing piece, but let's put together, let's get the, the, the concept from the pros. So we did our first deal with WWE uh, for short form content, uh, because that was a clear step forward from the previous content we were working with. Um, and about two years ago, what we noticed was there was a lot of short form snackable content out on the carriers, every carrier that we work with. What there wasn't was a proper OTT service um, that, that, that had real mass appeal. And I know around the world, there are dots of like a Spotify's um, or, you know, someone at Microsoft or Google connecting through Bango Boku. The deal that we've done with the NBA is completely different to that. I can't go into too much detail, but you can ask me about it later. But this deal is done not just for the NBA, but it's done for the carriers. 
We're not here to squeeze them out of more margin. Um, we're here to work with them to drive their margin and MBA's margin. And that's the big difference. Well, uh, I'm back with, I, I was actually one, just going back to the, the transition between being a sort of heavily focused on content to then working with EE. So I, I imagine in the early days you were working with a, a third party payment provider, weren't you? Yes. So how was the transition between saying, well, rather than using a third party, we're going to become a payment gateway ourselves? Because I mean, that was presumably fundamental to being able to take PM Connect Global, right? Oh, I'll the tell you what. The, or? Yeah, the DD is, is they, the, especially the UK they are so thorough um, and to be honest going through that we actually worked with um, the E team and Mike Round was working there at the time um, we went they helped us they walked us through it and they really kind of pushed it but it was tough and it did actually change us as a business we had to put in we had to think about different processes and things we had to put in you know because suddenly we weren't just connecting through a payment partner we're connecting into this billion dollar business with a huge level of trust being given to us um so it was tough um if you look we we expanded the business into multiple countries with 10 people in the business now because we take direct deals and have to work with the carriers on everything um, and we're focusing on becoming a strategic partner. We talk about that later. You know, we're 60 to 100 people um, because even though we may, we may, may be operating in the same level of uh, territories um, or slightly more, the OPEX to maintain and work with the carrier and build a good relationship is quite high from a technical point of view. It's, it's what I will say is the biggest problem and biggest opportunity in this business and this, this uh, technology is the fact that each carrier is different and it's not homogenized. There is a reason why Facebook, Microsoft, Google don't go into this space. It's because each of the technologies you integrate into are not homogenized. Yeah. And so they connect through a gateway like Bango or Boku. Yeah, yeah, that's really, that is really interesting. And I, in fact, uh, I think we should talk a little bit later about the role of the MNOs, because I know that in general, there's there's half the industry seems to sort of knock them and blame them for everything. But it, it sounds as though in many ways, especially because of where you come from, you're sort of perhaps slightly more benevolent and, and see more of a cooperation being the secret than anything else. But let's not let's let's get back to the nitty gritty of the deal. I'm going to hand over to Paul in a sec. But I just want to um, read another uh, fantastic quote from you on LinkedIn. Which, uh, which really illustrates why we've got you on uh, and why we think this is such an important deal. And you said this partnership is not only the most significant deal for PM Connect uh, by some distance, but the single biggest deal by a carrier player for a global brand's OTT product. If you don't believe me, then get in touch and I'll have a word. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, so I want to pass over to Paul because I know Paul's quite interested in sort of digging deeper there and, and talking about, you know, how, so let's talk about how big is this deal, James? Talk us through it. And how does it work? Sorry, Paul. Sorry, yeah, Paul. yeah, yeah. No, well, you're, that was your question, mate. Sorry. The first question. Uh, yeah, what, what, is this, what, what uh, can you reveal of the scale of this deal, James? Um, look, I can, I can give you bits and bobs. Obviously, look, I know my competitors will be listening to this, and the NBA have an absolutely huge legal team, which yeah. so I can I can talk around it. I can't give you the exact no, figure. No, 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 no. understandable. Oh. So look, um, if we take numbers, big numbers, uh, basketball, top three um, viewed sport in, in the world, 2.2 yeah. billion people watch it. The deal we have covers 300 million people um, and it covers a lot of the core markets and South Africa, uh, two areas, so core Europe and South Africa, two areas that we're expanding in quite heavily. Um, the value of the deal, again, I, can't, I can give rough numbers, but I can't sure. give you exact. Sure. So it's yeah. multi-year, right? Yeah. And the expectation and the commitment from parties is in eight figures. So it is huge. Um, yeah. That is, that is huge. Eight that is figures. Huge. Eight. Well, congratulations, um, mate. Um, so is that sort of uh, in these markets that you're, you're sort of taking it into, is this, is this sort of uh, new markets for the MBA or are they already got a presence there? And what difference does uh, having sort of DCB make to what they're trying to do? So I, I'm, I'm going to move, because I don't want to speak for the MBA here. I want to give you a trend rather than sure, okay. this is the MBA's problem. But a trend we've seen, a trend we've seen in sports is – 
There's a lot of big sports leagues out there. And what they do, especially American sports, is they operate in core markets and they have no problem selling to those core markets. Yeah. However, what they really struggle with is operating outside of those core markets mm. uh, because they can't build the fan base. They haven't got enough of presence. You see it with the NFL bringing games into London, NBA in Paris, WWE Tour of the World. It's their attempt to get these core hardcore fans because a fan isn't just a subscription to them. A fan is someone who spends two grand on tickets and merch. You know, what I'm wearing. Um, which was actually one of the main reasons of the deal. I just wanted to business expense, you know, all my MBA stuff. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so so what we've done with the MBA um, and our, our strategy with sports is, well, look, you're struggling with distribution and you're, you're, you've got this lovely D2C model of, of League Pass. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to partner you with the OGs of distribution. If you think about carriers... What do carriers actually do? They do a lot. And they, I love carriers, by the way, so I'm not attacking them. But at the end of the day, it's boring communication and infrastructure that they package up and put a brand behind. So you have an emotive feeling towards that brand. Gift Gaff runs on O2, you know, but you see yeah. them as different networks. Yeah. Um, and they are the kings. They are the original gangsters, the OGs, the kings of D2C. They, 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 are, they are the, the world to, to subscriptions, right? Um, and so what we've kind of done is we've taken someone who's a new player in the D2C space, in the NBA and these sports leagues, and go, let's do distribution through carrier deals because these guys in Europe, look, DCB acts as a payment choice, but they still have a huge amount of um, kind of, screen time on their brand um in africa people can't purchase stuff like this you know mm. they might be bankless they may but they may not have a debit or credit card in africa the, it, we're democratizing we're creating the opportunity for someone to subscribe and use the mba that wouldn't be able to do it before and in africa the carriers control the communication infrastructure even more um so for us in europe it's about um adding additional fans through the carrier distribution um, through by, by, by basically marketing to casual fans and working with the carriers to target them um, and leveraging the infrastructure of the carriers. And in Africa, it's about democratizing content. It's about making everyone available to be able to purchase what they want to purchase. Um, and you, I'm, I'm sure you guys know that DCB um, and payments for mobile has very different use cases in different continents and different countries. Um, and it's something that I've learned over the years. You know, I, I kind of um, alluded to it earlier when I kind of said, we assume we could just do the same thing in South Africa. Well, we can't, you know, we, 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 we had it to get a local presence, understand the market, understand the culture, build the relationship. You can't just parachute into different places and assume that you're just going to be able to, you know, do business there. Indeed, yes. So with the uh, the deal with the NBA, is this sort of to sign up new people using DCB into subscriptions or is it also going to look at sort of offering more casual fans a taster of it through snacking of bits of the content? How, how's that sort of going to work? So the entire deal is long form. So what, you're, what we're not selling is anything short form. We're selling full live games, full archive um, full, you know, what you don't see is with the NBA, they've got a huge amount of footage. They've got a 24 seven TV uh, like channel going on. Mm. Like what, one thing people don't understand if you don't follow it is the American sporting brands are so good at entertainment. They go beyond sport and they make it entertainment. Um, in, t in terms of, so, so in terms of what we can sell, so we've got a strategy with the carriers. We can sell full league pass. Right. So that's that's unlimited access to everything. We can sell team pass, which is cheaper. You follow a team. We can sell game pass um, where you just get eight games a month. These are all priced at different levels. And that is set with the NBA. Um, and then what we can also do is day passes. So those are single purchase. So really, we have a myriad of products that we can sell all, all long form. So imagine, you know, it's NBA finals. You can buy a day pass instead of signing up to a subscription. So it's even better for the, the, the consumer. So James, can I ask, what the, what's the top whack monthly subscription that you're able to process? Um, it depends territory by territory um, because there'll be different pricing structures. I believe, you know, you're looking at around 20, for the top whack, 24.99 a month, something like that, okay. max. Okay. 
So on that basis, you're actually going to be generating probably higher subscription levels than because I think online it's nine, the top whack is 99 quid the one off payment. Right. So you're actually you're actually going to be over the course of a year going to be generating more revenues um, for that higher for that higher premium. Product. Yeah. So the MBA you can pay annually, which we're allowed to do as well. But the PSD2 kind of limits the, the, the amount that you can charge in one transaction. So you can you can uh, pay annually or you can pay monthly. Now we, we tie in and, and so whenever, just so you know, whenever we do pricing, we have to tie in with MBA head office. So what we're not doing and saying is we're gonna um, undercut or cannibalize the MBA. We're adding to their volume, not trying to take customers away from them. So it's incremental revenues as far as they're concerned. Yeah. I mean, can I, I don't know if you want to probably don't want to touch on this too much, but I mean, obviously, uh, well, I suppose I can talk generally that, you know, over the years, uh, the issue of how much the uh, MNOs take for, um, for, for for being a payment partner there is an issue. Um, but as we know, there is flexibility in all sorts of markets now, when especially when it comes to working with big brands. Um, has that be? Have you found that your MNO partners are being particularly keen to take this sort of business on and perhaps change their pricing model slightly? Yeah. So, or can you not? No comment. Look, I I can't. Okay, I don't want my commercial team to get too angry, so I can't no, talk about enough. specifics. We we design, but we did. We designed this deal, and I, I can tell you something that I saw in the UK is what happened was. Um, you had very innovative but short form serv content services that were getting quite, a, the carrier was taking a large slice of that. And then any of the big boys were asking for like 95 plus, okay? And whether the carriers did the deal at that level, I do not know. But what I know is each year the big boys come in and they go, we want more percentage. Now, what they don't understand is carriers are not payment intermediaries. They do bill from the, the bill, but that's not their speciality. It costs them more than credit cards to collect. They have bad debt. Um, in, in, in places like Africa, um, $1 of credit is not anywhere near to actual $1 made by the carrier. It might be close to 60 cent, right? So giving a 95% payout, the carrier is actually losing money every time someone spends something. So the way that we did the deal was to say the carriers need their cut um, and we don't want to be the hand that jumps out to the carrier each uh, year and go, give us more. You know, it's not a sustainable model. At some point, the carrier is going to say no in your rev revenues flatline or they end up just turning it off because they're not making enough margin and they've got high, high OPEX. So the way we do, I, I'm an outcome based guy. So what I wanted was how do I get the MBA more fans? How do I keep a uh, carrier margin quite high? And, and, and I paired it together with this deal. Now I can't say exactly how, but I think you get what read between the lines in the fact that I can give the carrier margin and I can give the MBA new subscribers um, and we all benefit in the chain. So um, I'm going to step in now and say that, you know, I mean, again, you know, huge congratulations to you guys. Um, and I know, you know, Paul and I, over the course of the last uh, 38 weeks, have often talked about uh, DCB opportunity for future, how uh, certainly sports content is, is, is one of the most interesting areas. So no surprises that you've You've, you've, you've got a win there. Uh, mobile video, of course, is you know all the stats that keep coming out saying this is a, you know a hot application for us. So the two go together very well. And I know Paul has, has been an advocate an advocate for the snacking model, which which it sounds as though you're not necessarily focusing on with this particular deal. But I think what we'd be interested to know is more generally now. Um, you know, clearly you're a massive optimist about DCB. You've got every right to be. And I think obviously the strength of a relationship, a strong relationship uh, that's more partnership based with an MNO is the secret to driving this business forward. How do you see the next 12 months in terms of, you know, where we, where, you know, where, where do you see DCB? You know, what, can you predict any big wins? Do you think it's going to be more of the same or are we going to start seeing DCB work its way into all kinds of weird and wonderful areas? Yeah, yeah what I, yeah. What, what areas are we going to see it going to also, particularly like unusual ones, do you think? So, 
Um, look, for, first of all, we don't deal with anything adult. I've got no problem with no, no, adult, no. but I can't no. comment. Oh, no. So I don't, I don't know if, I know you weren't asking that, but I can't comment on that section. Um, what I would say, so first of all, I love DCB. I, I think it is, if you look at the payment mechanism, I remember being at a PSA panel seven years ago and Decomo uh, were on it and it blew my mind. Like I was like, I'm not going to swear, but wow. <laughs> Um, you are digitizing payments here. It is like, if you actually look at the technologies, it's insane because you pair that technology with this crazy reach. Everyone has a mobile phone. So yeah. I love uh, digital payments um, or, or mobile payments and specifically DCB. Where we're posesh- positioning ourselves and where we're moving here is we don't want to be just the DCB partner. We want to be a strategic partner for the carriers. So the reason why we're moving away from stackable content um, per se is because what do the carriers want more than anything? Well, they want more revenue, right? Absolutely. They want to leverage their infrastructure, which goes across not just DCB, but across marketing, across data. And most importantly, they need um, emotion connected to their brand. They, they need emotion with their brand because it is boring app infrastructure packaged up as a brand, right? And, and, and you'll see them carry different messages. So what's most important for us for our product side is that it is a motive sell to the customer. So a customer will buy, um, you know, buy MBA through, let's say, EE um, and connect EE and the f- amazing entertainment they get through MBA and, and, and actually gain loyalty for the carriers. Because then suddenly it makes sense for the carriers to leverage their infrastructure for the MBA, you know, because they, they, they get the emotive connection. Yeah, it's yeah. the same, you, you, you will notice, we've done the same thing with cloud gaming. Um, so cloud gaming hits all the right notes. It is a growing um, industry that's about to explode. Gaming is incredibly emotive, is incredibly data heavy, cloud is. So what do the carriers want? They want to push their brands emotively and they also need to push 5G because I've gone, I've upgraded from 4G to 5G. It's a nice to have, but is it worth the extra money for some people? Probably not. If you can't cloud game without, without it, well, suddenly you're like, okay, EE provides me cloud gaming with 5G. Um, so for us, we don't, we're trying to move beyond just DCB and payments, which, which, and we want to become a strategic partner. And that's where we really see the markets uh, going. If you look at what's happened over the last kind of two years industry side, we're seeing consolidation. You know, Fortumo were bought by, was it um, Boku? Yes. Yes. Oh, hang on. Um, yeah. Two is Boku, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we saw to come a digital bur- bought by digital Virgo. Yeah. Um, you know, we saw Phonics list a fantastic. Yeah, I can see they're on now, but well done to them. That's gr- that was great for industry. But we're yeah, seeing yeah. this uh, kind of consolidation of partners either jumping in and getting bigger or jumping out and kind of giving up. Um, now we're we're using the MBA deal to jump in even further to put our money where our mouth is and to really start driving something that sits above DCB. Right. And don't get me wrong. There will be DCP elements in it, but it's about more strategic partnerships with the carriers than just one payments partnership. He speaks very well, Paul. I think we should get him on again. <laughs> it's, I say it's really good. It's really interesting as well, because it is a, a, a much it's about look, not this isn't just about carrier billing, is it? This is about, like you say, leveraging the carrier whole carrier network and its infrastructure to to help well I give something to consumers but also to help deliver consumers to brands but also to give the networks a way of making more money out of their network infrastructure it's yeah it's a nice sort of virtuous yeah uh, it's, it's it's a really nice ecosystem that we're working yeah. with and I think there's benefits on both sides I hate the thing is so what I started pitching it as internally was multi-channel approach and I noticed people just went to sleep as soon as I said it so I'm still working on the wording <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the kind of thing that wakes me up. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Paul, I, I wanted to, to ask you. I know one of the uh, areas that you were you were looking at was some of the risks and some of the fraud issues. That uh, we, we is, have there, to mention it, don't we? we just, this always comes up. The sort of uh, you know, the more carrier billing that's being used, the more sort of digital content that's being consumed. There is inevitably a rise in in 
content fraud. There's also a rise in payment fraud. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one. Obviously, I don't want to drag the MBA into that particular discussion, but in a more general sort of sense. Yeah, so, and, I, and, and I know you... Um, where's you that? Know, you've, you've, you've covered it within telemedia pretty pretty consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the coverage is good. I think, I think if we're going to be a serious uh, payment player, we need to accept that we've got to address fraud, right? There's fraud in every payment mechanism. Um, and if you ignore it and pretend it's not happening, you're ultimately going to kill the payment mechanism, you know, because you're just going to get angry consumers. Not, not only to mention that payments is only one part of a carrier strategy. And if they yeah. see that payments is damaging their brand, they will get rid of it so quickly. I, I remember this fantastic uh, presentation by, uh, it was Peter Garside at EE that he gave, which was like, here's our, it was like a big heart and it said, here's our carrier revenue. And then he gave a really little heart and he was like, here's what uh, payments does and it was like we, if this if, if payments ever risks our big carry revenue you know w- the big one's going to win so so it's important for us to do I think look as I outlined it's a cap first first thing we need to sort out in industry is accountability right um mm-hmm. how many times have you talked to providers and if you're carry you probably have if you're someone else it gets passed down the chain so the carrier says I've got a complaint uh, that's fraudulent. The aggregator then goes, well, you need to speak to our partner. The partner says, well, it was brought on by this affiliate network. The affiliate network then goes, um, yeah, it was this affiliate that we don't really know, right? And by, by the end of it, you've gone through like six days worth of chasing and the guy doesn't even exist. And then we just forget about the whole thing. It's about accountability. So for me, the buck stops with the person processing the payment, right? You need to understand what's going on if you don't investigate it. Um, I, I also, you know, I saw um, you wrote, there was an article written on Telemedia around, you know, paying affiliates in Bitcoin. Well, mm. for me, paying people in an anonymous peer-to-peer cryptocurrency that doesn't leave any audit trail is the wrong way to go about buying traffic. You know, you want, you want to have a paper trail to know where it's come from. Yeah. Um, I also think what we're seeing is, and you see it over the next last three years, is this huge rise in anti-fraud. Um, Now, I don't want to talk about specific solutions, but some solutions are better than others. You want an anti-fraud that can handle large scale, um, has no conflict of interest. I feel really strongly about that. We use anti-fraud, but we don't have any interest in anti-fraud companies. Um, Has no conflict of interest with another provider. Um, And and someone you can trust to meet and acts as an independent third party. They're not servicing the merchant, they're servicing the carrier, you know? Um, and, and you also need to act on the data they give you, right? So if, if, if a merchant is sending through 60% of traffic that's being blocked, right? So out of 100, 100 people, 60 are getting blocked because of fraud. Well, either your anti-fraud's broken or your merchant clearly does not give a, a, no. again about any traffic. So cut them off, you know? Because it might be that the 40 are just getting through the anti-fraud through a different system. So it's about accountability and taking action. If you look at it across multiple payment sectors, multiple payment mechanisms, um, you know, there is a lot of KYC um, on merchants, right? There is a lot of DD on merchants and there's very strict limits. Um, And we need to make sure, we need to just start off with accountability and transparency. Who is responsible for the traffic buying? My opinion is it is the merchant. Even if you give it to someone else, that is your responsibility to manage. So if, so, if there's a bad flow, that goes on your table. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I think it just needs to be enforced. It's very interesting. I, mean, I don't know uh, uh, how you guys feel, but I, I do think that there's, there's a tendency and has always been a tendency to sort of finger point up the chain or down the chain. It's either the, it's either the MNO's fault or it's the... Uh, or it's the merchant's fault or the affiliate's fault. But I mean, it's interesting what you, you said there. I mean, I think I, we can see where your allegiances lie and how you've developed your business and why, you, um, why you've just said what you've said. And I, and I, and I would, I would uh, urge everybody uh, to go onto the Telemedia 8.1 website under the, and there's a, a conference that we did in, in partnership with MEF, that, uh, a panel session that you took part in called Balancing Retaining Revenues and Reducing Content Fraud. Um, where, I mean, you said, uh, uh, you mentioned a lot of those issues with regards to accountability, but I thought that was a really excellent session and one that everybody should watch. And, and, and again, you know, I think that point of, of using reputable third party anti-fraud companies where, you know, they are doing their job and not, they don't have a vested interest in the payment provider. 
is clearly, and you know, I mean, it sounds obvious, but clearly the right business structure to at least start to deal with those kinds of issues. Because if you're not, you're going to yeah. have a very bad relationship with your MNOs and you're never really going to get very close to I'll, it. I'll put, I'll put it like this. If you've got a bad relationship with your MNOs, you're doing it wrong. Like, yeah. put it like this. The MNOs are the hand that feeds us, right? All the partnerships we do relies on the MNOs. They, they, are, they are the people that I want to like my business. Um, I do not want to go legal with them, argue with them about fraud. If they say they're worried about something, I look at it and I go, right, this is how I'm going to solve it. And here's an action plan. I don't go, oh, you shouldn't be worried, you know? Right. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, in the next couple of months, we will have MNO week at Celebrator 8.1. It'll be a celebration of all things operated. Welcome one and all. Uh, right, now, listen, um, we, I could, we could talk uh, to you all day, James. You, you're an inspiration and, uh, and we really appreciate you being so generous with your comments and uh, giving us uh, an insight into your particular story. We want to just divert you a little bit into some other areas. Um, because there were, there, believe it or not, there was a couple of other stories apart from the PM, uh, PM Connect NBA deal last week. <laughs> uh, and we're just going to touch on two because we haven't got too much time. Um, the first one was uh, live game streaming surged by 80%. It's 8.8 .8 billion hours watched in Q1 of 2021. This data came from 123 Commerce and it focused on Twitch, Facebook gaming and YouTube gaming. Now, before I hand over to you guys, um, I've got a confession to make. For the last 38 weeks, um, we've often mentioned game streaming, and then I pretend to talk about it as if I actually know what it is. So I thought, but the fact is I'm a fraud, um, because I really only know in principle. So before we came on, I actually visited Twitch for the first time in my life. I had a look at Facebook gaming and YouTube gaming. I have to say... Uh, I quit. I'm too old for this game. I did not understand it. I found the whole thing baffling. I spent five minutes watching a lady wandering down the street, punching people. It was, and, and, and so I know nothing. I, it's not my game. Paul, James, tell me what's the appeal. And, 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 but thank God for it. Well, I, I must admit, I don't play them either, but I, I'm, I'm more aware of what they do and, and uh, I sort of study like, how it is as a business. I just think it's quite interesting because I've followed gaming in particular since the days of sort of consoles and buying like cartridges to load into them. Uh, and I, I think it's fascinating how it's changed from that to uh, a more digital model and then it's become a much more sort of casual and streamed affair Mobile gaming obviously has, has made it sort of something that a lot more people do on a casual basis. But this idea now where it's sort of streamed and you play with other people and that is, is, you know, a, a huge step for it. And what intrigues me about it is that so many people are doing it and who who's monetizing it. And you know, This research here, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it lists Twitch and YouTube gaming and Facebook gaming. You think this is all happening on other platforms. This isn't the sort of, you know, Sony and uh, EA Sports and all the rest of it. It's, it's these people. And I think that's, you know, you see this in all sorts of industry sectors where it's increasingly becoming YouTube and Facebook and Amazon and Apple who are sort of taking this over. I watched a really interesting documentary about, um, uh, about um, uh, Dr. Dre, and uh, his launch of Beats headphones uh, that's on Netflix. Uh, and he really sort of understood how Apple were going to be the music industry. And I think this similar thing is sort of happening in games. And game, game streaming is quite an interesting one to watch because it's sort of what's happening also in music and video and everything else. So yeah. uh, well, that's James, why I'm interested in it. But, but yeah, I, mean, John, what's I, your... I, I love you brought this up with me. I'm the customer here. So um, let, let me tell you a li let me tell you a little bit. I've I've gone to cinemas to watch Counter Strike um, like matches uh, and and then play. I have gone to there's a the huge event um, in Birmingham called Insomnia where it's like a load of computer nerds like me, right, who sit in a dark room playing games with each other, right? But is that the NEC? It's it is incredible. I am I am not surprised one bit that this market's taking off. I watched just I watched Twitch when it was Justin TV, right? Mm. And Justin TV then turned into Twitch and then sold to Amazon. Um, 
most of the company, most of our company watches game streaming. They'll watch World Cup streams. It is what 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 is missed is there's people who like sport and there's people who have these game streamings who who their World Cup is the Fortnite World Cup. You know, and 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 you, it's it's really easy because I've spoken to people who like sport, and they're like, "Well, anyone can do it." You know, anyone could can shoot people in Fortnite. Well, anyone can play football. Yeah. You know, but the best in the world, you ain't getting near. Um, and I think this industry is just going to grow and grow and grow. You have two very large beer moths in YouTube um, and Twitch, uh, Amazon. Um, they've clearly invested in this. It, their audience numbers are growing year on year um the players and you 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 will the players the top players in this space um and i mean the individuals you know like the ninjas they're 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 raking in 30 to 100 million a year just as wow. individuals um they, you know what, yeah sorry, say, do you know what i think is really interesting is how people like organizations like the nba uh tap into this because obviously, as you said earlier, American sports organisations tend to be more about a kind of holistic entertainment package, the 24-hour TV and all that. I think that there's obviously a massive opportunity for them, to, I think, to also get involved with live stream gaming, mm. live stream gaming tournaments. Otherwise, they are going to lose a big chunk of audience. Younger yeah. people aren't going to grow up watching basketball. They're going to grow up watching Fortnite. Do, yeah, I, I mean, don't don't forget they have NBA two K one, NBA two K two, and they they host they host championships for that. Um, I mean, the NBA is a company. I won't go into too much, but they do a lot. I mean, they're one of the original adopters of NFTs. If you know if you know about the That's NFT right, okay. grow, they 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 have pack NFTs. You can buy a Jordan moment for like twenty five grand. You know, the, these guys are innovative. They. I, I, they were talking to me because we did this deal over the course of three years. It was a long deal to get done. When I first met them, they were talking to me about, you know, streaming, sponsoring, uh, pushing 2K. The, 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 and, and, you know, if you know those companies getting involved, um, yeah, mm. this, this is this, you know, my, 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 my summary would be this market segment is going to keep growing. Um, I don't think the carriers are really monetizing it too much yet. And I think there's a huge opportunity for them to to gain with data consumption. Um, you know, it's 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 a huge reason to get five G instead of four G. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, can I just ask you? So, I mean, do, you, do I mean, what um, plans for PM Connect with regards to this sector, and what opportunities for DCB? So, the first thing we're doing is rolling out cloud gaming. So, what what we're trying to do is um, cloud. I, I, you, you may not have seen our webinar, but cloud gaming, as someone, because I grew up on an N64 and Super Nintendo, and you used to fuck, blow the cartridge, put it in, and hope that it loads, and hope that your save's still there, right? Um, you then used to get these massive, like, hot computers that would do, um, like, um, like, you know, do really complex processing in order to play, like, quite a basic game. What the cloud gaming sector does is honestly magic. You have a low-end Android phone, you, you load up Fortnite, it's playing in 1080p on a setup that would cost you like three grand, and suddenly you can interact with it. Um, yeah. the, the, you know, in, in, in places like the UK, where you've got quite a you know, high um, GDP per capita, might be an option, right? In Africa, they don't have the affordability to use the... Um, you know, to, to, to use, to, to buy the base infrastructure. So this is the only way they do it. Um, and I, I, so the way that we're focusing on it is through cloud gaming. Cloud gaming then allows people to participate in cloud gaming um, tournaments. You're seeing that for carriers, cloud gaming is the perfect match because gaming is very emotive. So yeah. they can um, merge that um, with their brand. They can then run tournaments to show off their connectivity. Uh, and infrastructure, it is the perfect match. And I think that's where we're going to see growth in the short run. Most carriers I've seen are going after cloud gaming pretty hard. Um, yeah. And it's it's going to be a very fast growing market sector in the next five years. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, even though even though it's obviously not aimed at me, I mean, we've, we know enough and we've seen enough um, editorial columns written about this in the last 12 months to realise that 
it's just going to get bigger and it's a really massively exciting opportunity and when we talk about the tip of the iceberg the dcb for sure a big chunk of the iceberg is going to be in cloud gaming and um you know i'm sure that we're going to be writing a lot more about um the wins that we see across the globe in that particular sector and i, I think this also brings us on to the uh, quite mm -hmm. nicely onto the the final story um which again you know as an old man i'm just thinking goodness me i, I never saw this one coming so this the headline is i know Jeff, it's all right you can, you can do this you can do this next year <laughs> app any data shows brands embrace in-app gamification as ex ex experiential shopping takes over and i didn't even know what experiential shopping uh, even meant, but we are now talking about uh, the likes of Louis Vuitton, Burberry, Gucci, Puma, um, uh, all getting involved in linking their brands within the games. Uh, and this, and I think Paul and I have talked about um, gaming, all, you know, also being viewed as a as a media and marketing channel, a marketing channel particularly. And I, I guess, guys, um, this is something along those lines. Another another step up the ladder towards towards integrating marketing, media, and games. Well, yeah, I think a gaming and game-like experiences are going to become the the norm for you know e-commerce. Uh, it's how brands will market. It'll also increasingly be how brands sell as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting thing. I think yeah, because as James was saying about the sort of power of of, of gaming, it, it just takes it. You know, it's going to start to crop up in in lots of other places because that's what a whole generation of people have grown up with. And you know, they just view all of it as, as game as a game and should be a game. And is that's how it's entertaining to them and how it engages them. So yeah, I think App Annie's uh, study finds that uh, there's a lot of money in this and it is a sort of quasi marketing sales channel now. Yeah. I, I love gamification as a concept. I, I love it. I think um it goes far beyond but but one of the original um kind of examples of gamification have you ever tried to fill out a catch form where it says fill out uh, can you pick all the boats in this picture yes right yeah. and, yeah, and yeah. then you get access to the content what it's actually doing is it's making you do something that it needs to understand and then give you so two of the pictures it will know all boats and then two of the pictures it won't and it's mm. organizing the pictures based on what it's asking um, and, it, and then it trains AI to do the same. So that's, and that's just accessing content. In this case, what, you, what we're talking about is putting brands into games. Um, again, you know, Paul, Paul kind of talked about it. Um, the emotion that's with games is so strong that it makes sense for the brands to try and do it. The important thing is organically. Right. But just you can kind of imagine, you know, I play Fortnite and then like a 12 year old kills me and dances over me in some Gucci sliders. You know, I might be like, those are pretty nice sliders. I, I, I want to be I want to kill people. I think. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think, again, it's, it, it's another brand trying to tap into the emotion that is behind gaming. If you're not a gamer, you may not see the the level of commitment gamers have like to what they're playing and the the amount that it takes up of their life um, and we're seeing a generation grow that's built on game streaming um really accessible cheap consoles you know you can get a ps2 ps3 with good games on um and the, and the amount of content online and even if you can't do that you've got you've got cloud gaming where you can play any game anywhere in the world you're seeing this generation kind of come up with something that we never had access to um and that's, you know, we, we're going to see companies, and I see it in Fortnite already, I'm sure it happens in other games, start to work with these games in order to monetize their brand and, and associate their brand with something fun or good. Yeah, totally. totally. Well, I don't know about you, Paul, yeah. but I feel, I feel so much better about where we're at now. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It, <laughs> uh, it's just so, it's, a, it's uh, upsetting because a lot of this stuff is just not what we do and well, not what we grew up with, but, you know... We well, have we have other experiences to draw on. That's, yeah, mate, that's that's all age. We well, uh, listen, guys. We're running out of time. I mean, you you know, I said at the top of the vodcast that uh, I had James down as a nominee for Telemedia Man of the Year, and uh, I hope that after uh, after this session, anybody that watches uh, either live or, or watches uh, on demand later on will see exactly what I mean. I think that it's so important in this industry that um, is all about driving the 
the, the, the numerous uh, strategic opportunities that there are with the telemedia technology, not just in terms of payments, but in terms of marketing. And a big part of uh, selling that technology into the wider market is all about the personalities behind it. It's all very well saying, well, you know, these are the reasons why DCB is great. I don't know why people get it, but somebody's got to actually stand and take this stuff to market. So uh, in the telemedia industry, we need as many people with as much enthusiasm as James to do that. We'll try and champion uh, the industry as, as hard as we can. But uh, I think everybody owes people like James a debt of gratitude for... Uh, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the kind words. Um, I, I, love, I love this. I, I, I grew up on telemedia, right? Um, I love this publication. I love this, this industry. Um, I don't think you'll find many 30-somethings that say that, <laughs> but I, there's something about it that I love. Um, and what's crazy is, so we launched, we, we did the MBA last week. Um, Tom will kill me with not, not being able to say too much about it, but we, we also launched this huge kind of crediting deal um, with E, which we couldn't even talk about because we had to give the MBA the comms time. So you're going to see this move forward as well. But yeah, I, I just, sorry if I interrupt. I just want to say thank you very much for having me. I read your guys' stuff all the time. Um, and, and I was saying before, you guys were the first trade show I went to in this space. I loved it. Well, we're, we're honoured. Paul, what do you reckon? Uh, it's, yes. no, it's good. It's good to hear. It's good to hear that, that it, it uh, makes a difference. It's great to hear that, that you went, it was one of the first trade shows you went to. Because it feels like we've been doing it a long time. But it's good, <laughs> good that people still, uh, all, the, all the generations are catered for. Uh, this okay. is what we need. This is what we need, Joe. More young, younger people. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So listen, we really do need to sign off. It just uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you to everyone that's been watching live. Obviously, you can find Paul, James, and myself at Telemedia Eight Point One. If you haven't been there this week, go there. Do a search. Reach out. Make a connection. Watch a, a, a watch a, a conference session. Share it. Uh, it's a platform that's a resource for the industry. Uh, and it's only as good as the people that use it. So uh, I'll see you at 8.1. James, you have been the best guest. Um, you've set the bar pretty high, and uh, we'll have to see if we can do better. I doubt it. Thank you very much. Look at the it. back of this jacket, though. Check it out. Oh, my that is very nice. Nice. <laughs> and it's me and a Fred Perry. I'm so <laughs> down with the kids. Yeah.